Praise the Lord, friends, and welcome to the broadcast. I'm so glad that you've tuned in. We are teaching from my series, No More Shame. And you know what? If you're struggling with shame, you need to really get a hold of this message. And if you get a hold of this message, it will change your life. And it will not only free you from shame, it'll free you guilt, condemnation, uh, you know, the effects of that, sin, um, all kinds of stuff that shame can cause in your life. And we've talked about a number of ways to walk in this. We talked about the power of a godly confession. You need to confess that Jesus is Lord. You need to confess that you're a believer. You know, just making a bold confession that I'm a believer can help separate you from some of the people you need to be separated from and help get you connected to some people you need to get connected to. You need to confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. That's what the Bible says. You know, we need to, we need to look at these things in the Bible and use them to our advantage. Um, the second thing we've talked about is an understanding of authority. The fact is today that we reign with Jesus and we've been free from sin and we've been given dominion as believers. And when you understand that, it changes the way that you live your life. You know what, we're not to walk around in life like some whipped dog. Uh, you know what, we, we have authority in life. We've been, been given dominion. And when you take your authority, when you understand that you're free from sin and free from shame, you can have a brand new boldness and a brand new confidence in Christ. You can pray prayers and have them answered in, in, in a regular fashion. You know, that happens to me all the time. You know, I just read this uh, statistic about a certain person, George Mueller, and he, he uh, recorded in his journal over 55,000 prayers that he prayed that God answered. And I know sometimes I've been amazed. I was at a men's fellowship one time, and I was having a major problem in a certain area of leadership in the church. And, this, and I, I just didn't know how I was going to get around it. And this person basically said, you need to take this and write it on a three by five card. And he handed out three by five cards. And I wrote this problem down. I stuck it in my jacket, forgot about it until the next month. Happened to put on the same jacket, went down to the men's fellowship. And he said, you remember what you wrote on the card? And I'm like, yeah, that's been taken care of. Man, God answers so much prayer for us if we just think about it. You know, the Bible says continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. And we need to continue to pray. We need to continue to believe God. But uh, thank God we've been given authority. We reign with Jesus. We're free from sin. We're given dominion. We need to walk out our God-given authority. The other thing that we talked about is, you know, receiving the grace of God and the righteousness of God. And where righteousness reigns, there is no shame. Praise God. And we talked about this in Romans 5, verse 17 and verse 21, that we've been come out of the reign of sin and death, and we've come into the reign of grace and righteousness by uh, faith in Jesus. And since we've done that, that leads us into eternal life. It leads us into a relationship with God through Christ. So not only have we been set free from sin and come into righteousness, we've also been set free from legalism. Because just like sin will kill you and shame is destructive, did you know what? Legalism kills you. And legalistic people will heap shame on people. I mean, I've lived around legalistic people and I've seen it. It is horrible. In fact, there were, I pastored in this small town in eastern Colorado and there was this one man and he was so legalistic. It was terrible. And he was just, it was just awful. He came to my church some and man, God, it was, it was just hard to deal with this person. And anyway, you know what? He was mean. He was religious. He told my wife and I, and we had left a large ranch and different things to go uh, preach the gospel. And we were starting out in low-income housing. He said, if you were really serious, you'd live in a tent. And I mean, this guy was just as mean as a snake. And you know what? He ended up you know, he, he was mean. He told everybody how bad their kids were and how he's better than everybody else. And at the time that he told my wife and I that we ought to just go live in a tent, when we had already left a nice ranch to go in the ministry and we were living in low-income housing, he was living in this big ranch house, and he ended up losing that job and living in a trailer. And he ended up having some more kids. He'd be so critical with other people and their kids, putting them down. And, boy, he got these two little laundry kids, and, it, it you know, it was different. But you know what? His kids put up with this for a while, but when they got 20, 21 years old, they went crazy. They could not stand this legalism. 
His wife was married to him. And, you know, there was a man in the town that I was ministered to, and he was kind of the town woman. You know, people know more than they should in these small towns. They know everything about everybody. It's kind of like pastor, and everybody thinks they know more about you than they really do. But it was just really, it was really a tragedy, to be honest with you. But, but this woman eventually left him, and this was not God. I don't believe it was the will of God, so on and so forth, but it wasn't the will of God for him to be legalistic and be mean like a snake. It was terrible. And I actually saw her after she got with this guy that I'd been reaching out to, tried to minister to, that had pretty, you know, bad, what we consider bad history with women and, and different issues. But I'd reached out to this guy and tried to be kind to him and, and done different things with him. But anyway, she, she ended up leaving this guy and getting, getting connected with And I saw her at another place up in a larger city in Colorado, in Colorado, in northern Colorado, and she actually looked about a thousand times better. You know, legalism is deadly. I just can't tell you, just legalism is terrible. And, you know, some people, they are, they are, they are saved, but they're mean. And God doesn't want to save you to make you mean, and I'm not trying to be mean myself. I think some people think I am because I want certain things done in certain ways, but at the same point in time, Man, we need to let the grace of God work in our lives and be gracious with other people. And we need to get set free from legalism. Legalism kills. You know, the Bible actually talks about being free from sin in Romans chapter 6. But in Romans chapter 7, it talks about being free from the law. And you know, the Bible actually says that the law is the strength of sin in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 56. But what we need to do is take people from Romans 5, where we, the Bible says we died to sin, we lived to God, or that's Romans 6. But in Romans 5, it says we left the reign of sin and righteousness and come into the reign of grace, uh, or sin and death, and came into the reign of grace and righteousness by faith in Jesus. In Romans 6, we died to sin and now we live to God. And Romans 7 says we died to the law so that now we can live to God. And we need to get people over into Romans chapter 8, where there's life in the Spirit. And that's where this true victory is. You know, the Bible says in Romans 8, verse 1, there is no condemnation. There is no judgment against those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And my question to you is this. How do we experience no condemnation? Do we experience this in Christ or out of Christ? You see, the only way you can really experience this is in, in Christ. You see, the Bible says this in Ephesians 2, verse 1. It says, you hath he quickened, or you hath he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Before you came to Christ, you were spiritually dead. You were dead in trespasses and sin. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We've all sinned. We are all worthy of death before Jesus, but when we believe on Jesus, we're given righteousness as a gift. And, and it, where he says the wages of sin is death, but he says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So every, when you read 1 John 3, 1 John 3 says, whoever commits sin transgresses the law, for the law for sin is the transgression of the law. You see, the fact is, when we study the gospel, we find out we're dead to sin and free from sin, but we're also dead to the law, and, and, and legalism empowers sin. Do you know the Bible says that in 2 Timothy, or 1 Timothy chapter 1, it says that the law was not made for a righteous man, but it was made for profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for, for men stealers, kidnappers whoremongers, all these people that are in all this grotesque sin. If you're in that, we could take the law and beat you to a pulpit and get you to get saved. That's what the law was made for. But the law was not made for a righteous man. You cannot take the law and get more righteous. You are as righteous as you'll ever be the moment that you believe on Jesus. Your spirit is 100% righteous. You have received the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And if you begin to realize that, man, I am the righteousness of God in Jesus. I am as righteous as Jesus is righteous. It's going to begin to change how you live your life. So we are not only dead to sin, but we're dead to the law. And legalism empowers sin. 
So what does it mean to be dead to the law? Sin leads to death, and legalism leads to sin and death. Let's go to Romans chapter 7. I want to show you some things in Romans chapter 7 and in Galatians chapter 3. And just like we read uh, in the broadcast before this in Romans chapter 6, how that we left the reign of sin and death to go into the reign of grace and righteousness in chapter 5, and then in Romans chapter 6 that we're dead to sin and alive to God. In Romans 7 it says we're dead to the law so that we can live to God. Now, he says this. I'm going to start in verse 1. Romans 7 verse 1. We're going to read the first six verses. He says, Don't you know, brethren, for I speak to them who know the law, how the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. As long as you live, the law has power over you. You die, the law no longer has power over you. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband is dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. My wife and I were married till death do us part. But if I die, she's free to marry whoever she wants to. Now, this is not talking about marriage and divorce and remarriage and all that. It's not talking about that at all. It's talking about the law and grace. So he says, then, if while her husband lives, she's married to another man, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband's dead, she's free from that law. So she's no adulteress, though she's married to another man. So, so if I die, my wife is free to marry whoever she wants to. There's nothing that needs to be done. I'm dead. That ends that relationship. That ends that covenant, right? So it says, wherefore, my brethren, you're also become dead to the law by the body of Christ. So when Jesus died... We as believers died with Jesus, in Jesus, to the law, and the law no longer has power over us. He says we become dead to the law, Romans 7 verse 4, by the body of Christ, that we should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, this is talking about before we got saved. The motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Before you got saved, you sinned, and that brought death in your members. But now that you've been saved, you are delivered from the law. So you're not only set free from sin, you're set free from the law, being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit. So when I died in Christ... I died with Christ. Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ in Galatians 2.20. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live now, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live the faith life in the flesh, If we, the life I now live in the flesh. So when we look at this, not only did we die to sin, but we died to the law. And if you read Galatians 2, where I was just quoting verse 20, and if you'll start reading in verse 16, through verse 21, you will find out when Paul is talking about death in, in Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. He's actually talking about being dead to the law. And you know what he says? We are d delivered from the law, being dead where and we're held. So we're dead to the law by the body of Christ that we should live to another. He says that earlier in verse 4. But then here in verse 6, he says that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. I'm not serving God because the Bible says thou shalt not and thou shalt. I'm doing what I want to do out of my heart. You know why I go to church on Sunday? Because I want to go to church. Amen. You know why I don't cuss? Because I don't want to cuss. I've cussed more than most of y'all ever cuss. But I don't cuss. I've been delivered from cussing. Amen. And number one, by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Number two, by revelation of grace. Amen. You know why I give? I give because I want to give. And you know what? I, I, I would give at least a tithe. The Bible says the tithe is holy, the tenth belongs to the Lord. But you know what? I, Barbara and I give something between 30 and 50% of our income every year. And listen, we're, we're giving far more than what, and we're living far better than we gave 10%. So don't complain about it. Amen? If you don't understand that, don't worry about it. Amen? He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. I had not known sin except by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin took occasion by the commandment and wrought in me all manner of concupiscence or evil desire. For without the law, sin was dead. In other words, the law made sin stronger. For he, for he says, but when I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to be life, the law, I found to be death because sin took occasion by the commandment, deceived me and slew me. 
because he says the law is holy and the commandment good and just, but that which is good was made death to me, God forbid, but sin that might appear sin. This was the purpose of the law. The law was given to make sin appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, so that sin by the commandment by, might be exceedingly sinful. But we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. The problem is not with the law. The problem is with me. He says, for I, I do that what I allow not, and I, what I would I do not. What I hate, that I do. If I do then that I don't want to do, I consent to the law that is good. Now it's no more me that, but sin that dwells in me. Now this is not the normal Christian experience. This is the Paul preaching, and he's talking about when he was Saul of Tarsus, a legalistic Pharisee Jew who was trying to get righteous by his own performance. And if you are in this place where you don't want to do what's wrong and you do it anyway and you want to do what's right, but you're not doing it, you're either, either legalistic or, or, I mean, legalism is messed with you. That is talking about, that is a, that's a legalistic perspective. And that's what legalism produces. But when you find out, listen, it's no longer me that's living, but it's Christ that's living in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It changes your life because you're identifying with Jesus. And you said, I died not only to sin, but I died to the law. He goes on to say in Galatians 2.21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, Christ died in vain. And so he goes on and he says at the end of this, Romans 7, verse 22, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into the captivity of the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? How can I get set free from this legalistic system that's bringing me into sin? He said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind I serve the law of God, but the flesh the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation. There is no judgment against those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Listen to this. Romans 8 verse 2 has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do because of the weakness of the flesh, it was weak through the flesh, God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. God didn't send Jesus so you could sin more. He sent Jesus so you could sin less. So do you understand? Jesus made you sinless. When you believe on Jesus, he paid for your sins, took your sin, made you sinless that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who are not walking after the flesh. We're not trying to do it in our own strength and own power, but after the Spirit. It's no longer me, but it's Christ living in me. Now, since I've received a new life, I've got to receive a new mind to walk out the new life that I've been given in Christ. And he says, they that are in the flesh, after the flesh, do mind or think on the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, to be minded according to the flesh is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Praise God, so you get spiritually minded. Amen. How do you get spiritually Get minded according to the Word. Get minded according to Jesus. Now, I want to turn, turn over to Galatians, and I want to read in Galatians chapter 3. We were in chapter 2. In chapter 2, Paul talks about this same thing. I, I identify with Jesus' death and I died to the law. Now, he, he's saying in, in Galatians 2.16, We know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the, law of, by the faith of Jesus, even as we believed in Jesus, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. You cannot be saved by your performance. You are saved by grace. You're saved by the work of Jesus and believing it, by putting faith in Jesus. It, he says this in verse 17, If while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners. He's talking about going back to the law and trying to be justified by your performance, trying to add law keeping to Jesus. He says, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? Because the law is the strength of sin. The law actually makes sin stronger. God forbid. For if I build again the Old Testament law, the things which I destroyed by believing on Christ, I make myself a transgressor. 
I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live to God. The law condemned me, so when Christ came, I'd believe on Jesus and receive his life and let Jesus live his life through me. It's no longer me that liveth, but it's Christ living in me. Amen. That's what he goes on to say. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I do not frustrate the grace of God. It's frustrating to try to add legalism or add something to Jesus once you've been justified by faith in Jesus. He said, then Christ died in vain. Now, in, in Galatians 3, he goes on and begins to say some things. And listen to what he says. In Galatians chapter 3, he says this. I want to start in verse 16. To Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He did not say to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God, the Old Testament in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after Abraham, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of no effect. In other words, God made his promise to Abraham and his promise is still in effect, even though the law came in effect after it. And the law tried to inhibit a lot of the promises from coming to pass. He says in verse 18, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. You do not receive an inheritance in the gospel by your performance. You receive an inheritance because of what Jesus did. If I receive an inheritance in the natural, it's not because of what I did. It's because of what somebody else worked, somebody else slaved, somebody else did, you know, they saved, they did all this. But I just showed up and believed it and received it. Okay, he says, what is the purpose of the law then? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come. Who is the seed to whom the promise was made? Jesus. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. He goes on. And he says this, he says, is the law then against the promises of God? Is the law against God's promises? Galatians 3.21, God forbid, if there had been a law given, which could have given life, righteousness would have come by the law. There was no way the, the, the law could give us life. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have need to come. But the scripture has concluded under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be to all those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up to the faith which should afterward be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under that schoolmaster. For you are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Thank God we are saved by grace through faith. We're saved by the faith of Jesus. For as many as you have been baptized into uh, Christ Jesus, listen to this, you have put on Christ, there is, and in Christ, he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, in other words, it's not about religion, it's not about race, it's not about class, it's not about gender, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you be Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, thank God we are the seed of Abraham. And we are heirs according to the promise. So how do I begin to walk in this no condemnation? How do I begin to walk in this freedom where I can walk in this victory that Christ won? Well, number one, I got to realize I'm in Christ. Number two, I realize that I'm dead to the law. But number three, I begin to realize that I am a brand new creation in Christ. And when you begin to realize it, it changes your life. You see, Paul says this. He says, if any man be in Christ, in, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, the same has become a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things have become new, and all things are of God. Hallelujah. You see, we're no longer in sin, but we've been made righteous. Praise God, and it doesn't end here. He says in verse 21, he, well, he actually goes on and says, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ, not imputing the trespasses of the world to them. Praise God, God was in Christ. He didn't gather up the sin of the world, but he, he made righteousness available to everyone. And so he says, now we then as ambassadors for Christ beg of you to be reconciled to God, be right with God. Surrender to Jesus. He said, for God made him, Jesus, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, to be sin for us who knew no sin, who never experienced sin, 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Man, when you get saved, when you believe on Jesus, you are made the righteousness of God in Christ. And you're as righteous as Jesus is righteous. And when you understand that, it changes how you live your life. So we're in Christ, we're dead to the law, and we're a brand new creation in Christ. It's no longer me living, but Christ is living in me. And I'm not ashamed as Jesus lives his life through me. Friends, I've been teaching on no more shame. And if you've been struggling with shame and guilt and condemnation, you need to get a hold of this teaching. This will help you. This is a three CD series that I taught recently, and this will literally set you free if you get a hold of these truths in this uh, teaching. And so we've got a special offer on this this week. You can call and get it. You can get online and get it. And we would love to hear from you. Praise God. If, if you need prayer today, I want to encourage you just to give us a call. We have prayer ministers that are here that are ready to pray for you. If you need prayer to receive Jesus, to receive forgiveness for your sins, to receive healing in your body, to receive a financial need met, whatever you need prayer for, Jesus wants to meet your needs. And he is here for you. I beg of you, surrender to Jesus. Praise God. We love you. God bless you. If you need prayer, give us a call. If you'd like to partner with us and help us share this message of grace, this message of Jesus and no condemnation with the world, just give us a call. We would certainly uh, love to hear from you. God bless you. We appreciate you. Thanks so much for tuning in. God bless you. Amen. Have a great, great day. As you remember, Jesus is Lord. Shame can cause you to make poor decisions and foster poor relationships. In this series, No More Shame, you'll learn how Jesus' sacrifice gives you the ability to live without any guilt or condemnation. You are free in Jesus. You can get it today for $19 with free shipping. Call 719-418-4000 or visit LawsonPurdue.com. Friends, I want to invite you to family camp meeting at Karis Christian Center in Colorado Springs. We are going to have a great time in the Holy Ghost. We're going to have a great time in the Lord. We have special children's meetings, special youth meetings, special Holy Ghost meetings for the adults. We have Pastor Mark and Trina Hankins, Ashley Teredes, myself, Pastor Max Cornell, Pastor Aaron Purdue. You can register at familycampmeeting.com. We would love to see you here in Colorado Springs. Thanks for watching Grace for Today. This broadcast is made possible by our faithful partners. If you would like to become a partner, need prayer, or have a question, please call us at 719-418-4000 or go to LawsonPurdue.com or write us at P.O. Box 63733, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80962. See you next time on Grace for Today.